So welcome to uh, today's program with our wonderful guests, Susan Nyman in Germany and Jelani Cobb in, Jelani, where are you tuning in from? I am in good old, the great city of New York City. That's what we like to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Ari Goldstein with the Office of the President at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Susan and Jelani are here today to discuss Susan's really meaningful book, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, newly out in paperback, which we'll put a link to in the chat momentarily. As Americans, we've been wrestling for a long time, but with particular energy this year, over the legacy of racism in our country. And when we ask questions about what monuments to keep and what monuments to take down and what to teach in our schools, they're parallel questions to what Germans have had to ask for a long time about their own history. Um, we as an American Jewish institution telling the history of the Holocaust in Europe have a vested interest in this conversation as do so many Americans for different reasons. So we're really uh, delighted to, to dive into it today with two great minds who have written and spoken uh, a lot about this. Susan Nyman is the director of the Einstein Forum, a foundation of the German federal state of Brandenburg that serves the public as an open laboratory of the mind. She was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and has studied and taught philosophy around the world, including at Yale and Tel Aviv University. Uh, she has seven major books, and her most recent book is Learning from the Germans, which she will discuss today. Jelani Cobb is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Born and raised in Queens, he was previously an associate professor of history and director of the Africana Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut. Jelani is also a recipient of the 2015 Sidney Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis Journalism, and his most recent book is The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress. So please feel free if you have questions and comments to submit them in the Zoom chat throughout the program and we will address them at the end. Without further ado, welcome Susan and Jelani. Thank you. So, uh, you know, Susan, I think it's kind of at the risk of this turning into kind of a, a fan fest. Uh, I really, <laughs> really admired your book uh, and I realized that we had a lot of overlaps uh, not just in our interests, but uh, but in terms of our frames of reference, uh, because you know you grew up in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta for twelve years, uh, and you know my first academic job was at Spelman College in Atlanta. Uh, and beyond that, my family on my father's side is from Georgia, and so uh, you know I was very familiar with Georgia and very familiar with Atlanta. And so some of the references that you made. Uh, about how the city is in its particular niche in Southern life uh, rang really true to me. Mm -hmm. And so it's just been really interesting to see that as a starting place for this bigger conversation. Well, I should add, as I mentioned in the book, that an awful lot of Southerners uh, don't consider me a real Southerner. My, my friend, the historian, uh, Diane McWhorter, calls mm -hmm. me a carpetbagger. Um, at which is kind of true. That is, uh, my parents moved from Chicago to Atlanta right before I was born. And so they were Yankee Jews. I didn't have a sufficiently Southern accent. And to top it all off, my mother got involved in the school desegregation campaign. So I, did, I never felt at home in Atlanta. I wanted to get out and move to New York City or possibly to Europe, neither of which I had a clue about. But of course, as I get older, I realize that I, I was in very many ways formed by that experience, um, mm -hmm. even though I hated it at the time. But it's so interesting to me because, you know, I grew up in New York, in Queens, New York, um, raised by a mother who was born and raised in Alabama and a father who was born and raised in Georgia. Uh, and so it's kind of the opposite, you know, set of experiences where I understand myself as a New Yorker. I didn't feel out of place as a New Yorker, but I also was very much shaped by these Southern experiences uh, and, you know, what it meant to have two parents who had come out of Jim Crow, really kind of fugitives from Jim Crow in, in New York City. But, you know, I am sure the Black Atlanta experience was a very different experience from the White mm -hmm. Atlanta experience, even though, you know, I was lucky, I was part of, I read about this a little bit in my book, the first integrated 
youth group, theater group, writers group in the city. And so I, you know, I didn't live an entirely segregated life, but it knocks me out to realize that, you know, Dr. Du Bois was alive and teaching in Atlanta University when mm -hmm. I was alive mm -hmm. and I had no clue, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, there were, there was a lot that I missed. Mm -hmm. So I think if we just wanted to look at, I mean, there's so many <laughs> directions for this conversation to go to, uh, but one of the things that uh, that struck me um, early on, you know, was the conversation around monuments and even um, the conversation about whether or not you can make a comparison uh, between Germany uh, post-Nazism and post-World War II and the South, uh, you know, post-Civil War and, and since. And one of the things that really kind of cemented that in my mind was my experience in writing about the Charleston massacre 2015. Uh, and so, and you make mention uh, of, you know, what happened there in the book, you talk about it. Um, and there's a little kind of curious geographical detail there, uh, which is that the, the church where nine African-Americans were murdered in the basement by a white, 21 year old white supremacist uh, in June of 2015, uh, the church is on Calhoun Street in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, named for John C. Calhoun, uh, the uh, antebellum era statesman, uh, former vice president, uh, and vociferous white supremacist and defender of institution of slavery, and really the intellectual godfather of secession. Uh, and so uh, he's literally an outsized figure in South Carolina history because there's a monument that was recently taken down uh, just a, a few months ago but this gigantic monument to Calhoun uh, that stands on this elevated, stood on this elevated platform. Uh, you could virtually look out over the entire city uh, as a kind of omniscient eye uh, mm -hmm. over the city. And so this is the street that that church was on. I didn't realize that, wow, yeah. Yeah, the, the church is maybe a block from the Calhoun monument. And, but that's not the point though. That, that's not the point I was getting to. The point that I was getting to is that when I went, when I was covering that massacre, uh, I went to the park to get a look at this, this monument myself. And I'm looking at it, you know, I'm taking notes about it, you know, I'm kind of walking back and forth. Uh, there's a, a sandwich place across the street. I went and got something to eat. And as I was leaving, I was walking away, I saw something else, which was about, 60 feet away from the Calhoun Monument. And I thought, uh, what is it? I'll just go over there and see what that is. I was kind of like, it was hot. I was like, I don't know if I want to walk back over there. But I walked back over there and I look and it was the Charleston Holocaust Memorial Monument. Huh. And what it said to me was that this city had so distanced itself from Calhoun's legacy of white supremacy, the destructive, inhumane, and disastrous consequences of this ideology, that they did not even see the connections or the contradiction between placing the monument to Calhoun, which actually stood there first, but the monument to those who died in the, in the course of the Holocaust within not even a stone's throw, within a few steps, yeah, yeah. Of the Calhoun Monument. So this is a fantastic example of exactly um, one thing that has made me quite angry, which is that Americans in focusing on the Holocaust as the epitome of evil have outsourced evil as something those guys did over there back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I will probably offend people by saying this, but I uh, I think Americans are overly focused on the Holocaust and in the wrong kinds of ways, um, because we know that there's evil in the world. Uh, you know, I mean, this is something that people sense from a very early age. 
And it's much better to, you know, uh, focus on the evils that other people do rather than the ones you do yourself. What's interesting about your story actually, um, so because I actually decided to uh, write this book uh, while watching President Obama give the eulogy in my apartment in Berlin, um, and it seemed to me that America was beginning this process, uh, which the Germans call, the Germans like long compound words, so they call it Verkangenheitsaufarbeitung, which I translate as working off the past. And it seemed to me that America was beginning that, and because I had been living here and thinking about this stuff for so long, I thought I could contribute something to the process. So when I was uh, in the South and I was there for six months, one time, and then another uh, you know, long, long trip, I did go to lay a flower at Mother Emanuel. Mm. But um, somehow I didn't notice either of those monuments. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, I just- well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily, depending on how you, I mean, it's right there next to it. But because of how the city is laid out, you could very well go there and not see it. I did. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as far as comparison goes, look, um, I, I, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about all the differences between um, the Civil War slavery and what I would prefer not to call Jim Crow. I know it's the word that people use. I think it... Um, it's a euphemism that's misleading because I think what Jim Crow suggests to people is, okay, it was a time when there was racial prejudice and there were racist stereotypes, but it wasn't a time of terror. Mm -hmm. And I like Brian Stevenson's use of the age of racial terror mm -hmm. um, because it was just, at least for most white people, I mean, I would say 99% of white people, even if they were involved in the civil rights movement, which you know was the atmosphere that I grew up in, they didn't know about the history to mm -hmm. the degree to which it was. So, of, but of course, there are all kinds of differences between those two events. You know, different countries, different cultures, different histories. But what interested me was what we could learn from each other. And and the interesting thing is, I I had the title of the book really before I had the book. And so when I was in the States in 2016, uh, interviewing people and going around looking at things, I, you know, I would say, well, I'm working on this book called Learning from the Journey. You know, why do you want to, you know, why do you want to talk to me, lady? Um, and I would say, well, there's this book. And people were really shocked by it. People just, you know, found the comparison really hard to deal with and I would justify it and so on and so on. Not black people, interesting mm -hmm. enough. I did not ever meet an African-American who thought, I, I mean, people were surprised, but, but um, I think African-Americans were not as upset by the comparison as most white people were. But then when I came back and, and finished the book and last fall, I was on book tour in the States, not a single person was offended by the comparison. And I think the difference is who's been sitting in the White House yeah. these past years. Yeah, I mean, I think that one dynamic in the United States is the thoroughly entrenched amnesia, um, it, which has been so largely successful that it's, it's denial that has been institutionalized. Uh, right. And so in, in W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, whom you also talk about, you know, uh, in your book, but he, he said something really insightful in Black Reconstruction. Uh, and he said at the end of the Civil War, the catastrophic destruction, you know, 700,000 plus dead, uh, which is almost triple the number of people that the United States lost in World War II. Right. Uh, and I would say for Vietnam as a frame of reference, the United States would have to fight Vietnam 12 times, more than 12 times to actually reach the number of casualties that it saw in uh, the Civil War uh, in that one four year period. And so looking at the manifold titanic destruction that this war wrought, 
no one had any interest in talking about what had actually just happened. Right. He said that the North was embarrassed to admit mm -hmm. that it had depended upon, for its saviors of democracy, this vaunted idea for all of its standing and, and classical roots and the intellectual heft. And democracy had been saved by 200,000 ex-slaves yep. who joined the Union Army and fought uh, to help Abraham Lincoln secure the ongoing Union. And they were embarrassed to ever admit that to history. And the South was similarly embarrassed, except they would not want to say that they fought to their last man for the right to buy, sell, rape, abuse, traffic, and exploit human beings. And so there was a gentleman's agreement between the belligerents of this war to never talk about what had just happened. God, he's so, he was so brilliant. I overlooked that. That's a really, really deep claim um, about uh, the North's shame. I overlooked that and I should have quoted it because actually one of the most interesting parallel that occurred to me when I was, when I was doing this work was that the first couple of decades of post-war Germans sounded exactly like the defenders of the lost cause. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, and they would, we, our cities are in ashes and we lost our territory and our men are in POW camps if they're not, uh, you know, dead and our children are hungry. And on top of all that, those damn Yankees are accusing us of having started the war. And when you realize that this is exactly how Germans in the beginning began to, uh, began to think about, uh, I mean, that, that talk about it, um, because they were ashamed that on top of the fact that they had been Nazis and they'd lost the war, and then they thought of themselves as victims, but, um, once you see that, I think, um, you realize that the urge to see yourself as a victim is natural, you know, it just is. Uh, you think about your own sorrows and your own sufferings. And if you can't think of your people as heroes, then you say, well, you know, they would have been heroes, but they were victims of history. Mm -hmm. But what the Germans did was historically unique was to move from this victim um, standpoint to say, you know what? Yeah, we suffered, but other people suffered worse and it was our fault. And if you see the resistance to that move, you can actually be quite hopeful about what might happen in America and what I think it's starting to happen in America because it's, it's normal for people to resist that even if they were Nazis, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't, I mean, I think I've, I've often thought that the United States is hampered by its own, it's, it's greatly impeded by its own sense of itself as exceptional. It is. Um, because it gives it a motive or, or a rationale for denying everything that they've ever done that's wrong. Uh, and so I was looking at this old book um, that Richard Hofstadter and Michael Davis historians did. Uh, in the 1960s is called uh, American Violence, a Documentary History. And it's I just kind of like, it's, it's, it's like a, not, it's not like a kind of major book or anything, but I, I went through it for some, 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 some very specific reasons. Uh, and it's dated now, but they make this observation that I think holds true. They went through comparing the amounts of violence in other places, you know, the tendency or the tradition of mass violence, pogroms, they just kind of stacked up where the United States stood and said that the United States uh, was somewhere in the middle, that it was a very violent society, but not nearly as violent as some societies were. Uh, and he said, but where the United States is distinct is in having a very violent society, but a population that insists upon being thought of itself as the most peace-loving people in the world. <laughs> and so, and this is something that doesn't even have the kind of uh, psychological weight that something like slavery uh, would have, you know, the reasons for denial. But we're just talking about plain generic violence. 
And it said, we really can't bear the thought of confronting history lest we be thought of as something less than exceptional in the, in the view of the world. You know, what I'm hoping, um, and, and I do see some signs of it, and we're, we're having these debates now, finally. Um, I am hoping that we can work through something, um, you know, and come out with nuance. Um, when I first came to Berlin in 1982, the sort of people that I would gravitate to, I mean, left-leaning artists, intellectuals, activists, they wouldn't read Goethe because they mm -hmm. thought all of German culture was contaminated because of the Nazis, okay? Mm. And, you know, this is now 38 years ago, um, and the Germans are coming to a more nuanced and balanced perspective of their history. America is going to have to go through something, and we are going through something right now, um, you know, that faces the fact that we're, you know, other, other places were just, you know, some tribes were running around and they landed somewhere and decided to, you know, form some kind of political system. And that's how other nations got founded. We were founded with these ideals that every American child learns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, covers over the fact that the ideals were violated from the very beginning of, mm -hmm. you know, pre-beginning of the country. So, so it's a, it's a, it is, there is something exceptional about the, you know, the, the clash between this idealization of what the country is about and, uh, you know, it's incredibly violent past. I mean, I didn't talk about violence towards Native Americans except in passing in this book because I just, I, I wanted to be able to go into some things in detail, mm -hmm. but I do mention it and of course, you, you know, it's horrendous. It's there. I, are we talk, speaking on what's now called? No, that's tomorrow. Indigenous Peoples Day. No, it's yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> is that yesterday? Which was, which was Columbus Day originally, if people thought of it, and now has, there's been a move to refer to it as Indigenous Peoples Day. My 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 vote is that we we recast Thanksgiving mm -hmm. as a holiday celebrating the contributions of immigrants to the United States, mm -hmm. since of course the Europeans were the first immigrants, although mm -hmm. they often don't like to see themselves that way. But you know, so so anyway, you you have this question. I don't think it means that the ideals are worthless. And you know, one of the things I wrote about briefly and that I've always been moved by is how many African Americans there were who insisted on you know, realizing those ideals as Americans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just, I, I don't know if you know, one of my heroes is Paul Robeson. I just wrote a short mm -hmm. piece about him. And, um, you know, if you ever heard his testimony before right. the yeah. AUAC, mm -hmm. you know, when the Congress says, well, why don't you go back to Russia? And he answers, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country and I'm going to stay right here and have a right. piece of it and no fascist minded person That's is right. going to stop me. I mean, it's just- It's it, amazing. It's, it's incredible, you know? And, and you know, I, I think I also, I, I'm always kind of blown away by the idea that his ballad for Americans was the only song ever played at the Democratic, Republican, and Communist Party conventions of 1940, you know? So, and, and it's, it, it is such a hymn, it's such a patriotic hymn that I haven't dared to play it for my children. I think they would find it just embarrassing kitsch and how can you listen to this stuff, you know? But um, there is this call to realize those ideals that we have seen violated. And I guess I, you know, I would like not to give up on them despite what's going on in the country right now, but because of what's going on in the country right now, I don't know how you see them now a few months later after the first 
Black Lives Matter demonstrations, but I have been very hopeful and not just because of the demonstrations, but because of the ways in which people were genuinely reading and talking and you know thinking about these questions. But I, I would be curious as, I, I, I know it's all, everything is a work in progress right now. It always is, but I also think that, you know, Robeson is exemplary in that way, you know, not just of how he saw, he was really speaking of a tradition when he was there, who people who said, uh, you know, we have two choices, which are to perish or to turn the society into a democracy, an mm -hmm. actual democracy. Right. Uh, and, you know, all this debate that has been driven by what democracy actually means, you know, in the United States, its best claims to history are the people who were left out of it. <laughs> you yep. know, the people who forced them to reckon with the fact that if you really want to call yourself a democracy, maybe women have to vote, you know, <laughs> like that's just, you know, maybe you want to get rid of the slavery thing. That's going to get in the way, you know, people seeing you as a democracy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who have this question uh, in the chat uh, about, and I cannot pronounce this word, uh, but okay. working, working <laughs> off the past. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so there are a lot of people who are wanting to, I guess, get some more specificity about what that actually implies. Like, what does that mean? Sure. Um, so as a concept, it means several things. It means, first of all, revising a historical narrative acknowledging one's historical crimes. And that needs to be done on a whole bunch of different levels. It needs to be done in the schools, obviously, but it's crucial that it be done in popular culture as well, uh, in film, in song, in all of those things. Obviously, if there are people who are alive who need to be brought to justice, um, they need to be brought to justice. If people, uh, who were victims can be compensated, they need to be compensated. But I mean, what I think is important to see in the German experience, first of all, it was done very, very differently in East and West Germany. We can talk about that if people are interested. Um, but it was certainly in West Germany, very slow, um, really quite reluctant and multi-generational. I don't think it's something, I, I was beginning to say it's not like a vaccine, which is a metaphor I used even before COVID. Um, and then I started thinking, actually, maybe it's like a flu vaccine because it's something you need to get every year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it, it isn't something that you're done with because these histories permeate so much of what we do. One of the biggest, um, uh, epiphanies I had, which I talk about in the afterword to the book, because it was about a week after I'd handed in the manuscript to the book and my publisher was impatient to, you know, get it done already, Susan. And I was in the States, I was going from one conference to another, and I was, I'd rented a car and I was traveling late at night on the New Jersey Turnpike in the rain. And I was tired. I was afraid of falling asleep at the wheels. So what do I do? I turn on the radio really loud and I start singing along. And suddenly there's Joan Baez singing The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Mm. Now, and I start singing along. Now Joan Baez's civil rights creds are as good as they get. I mean, she not only sang at the March on Washington, she sang in Selma and white people got killed in Selma. So this is a woman who, you know, and yet she was able to cover that song, which is an elegy for the lost cause. And I, I stopped myself sort of halfway through singing it and said, you know, could you sing the night they brought the, Wehr the Wehrmacht down? No, actually you couldn't sing that. And no one in Germany would dream of, you know, singing any song that, I, I won't say no one, there are groups of neo-Nazis and right-wing people, but it's a very small group. No, it's larger than it should be, let me, let me make that clear. I don't want to um, minimize it, but uh, it's totally condemned by the rest of the government and by anybody who's in, you know, even quite conservative media. And no one would sing a song idealizing 
the Wehrmacht in that way. So, so when you think about how, how pervasive this history is, you realize we have a lot of work to do and it's not going to be a one-shot deal. Yeah, I think one of the things that was really interesting to me um, is, you know, so I've been to Berlin once in my life and I flew there from Moscow. Ah, what were you doing <laughs> in Moscow, if I can ask? Uh, I did a Fulbright. Uh, I taught at uh, Moscow University for a semester. In what uh, year? This was 2010. Okay. Um, which was a very interesting moment, you know, to, to teach in Moscow. Sure. Uh, and uh, I flew to Berlin because I'd never been to Berlin before and I wanted to visit. And I got this really kind of, and I, I left after the May 9th celebrations in um, Moscow. Right. Which are, I mean, I was trying to explain to my American peers, May 9th recognizes the end of World War II, um, but it's the 4th of July plus New Year's, right. plus <laughs> several other holidays in sure. terms of how gigantic the recognition of it is. Uh, because they, you know, see this as the celebration of surviving an existential threat, uh, which is how it was explained to me. He said, Americans can't understand because you've never faced an existential threat in that way. And so this is kind of what this is. Uh, and I went from there to Berlin and it, it was a kind of notable thing to me because getting back to this issue of, of monuments, um, that I visited, one well, last thing, I visited the Museum of the Red Army while I was in Moscow. And it goes through, I take it, you know what I'm talking about, goes through the entire history of, you know, the Russian armies and so on, uh, and gets to World War II, which as you might imagine is a gigantic section of the museum. Uh, and there are all these uh, artifacts from World War II that were seized from Berlin. Uh, and they have a distinction in that they are the only objects in the museum that are displayed on the floor. <laughs> Everything else is mounted, uh, it is kind of in a way that you would imagine a museum to be, but when you get to uh, the kind of Nazi era eagle and the all of those kind of artifacts that were taken uh, when the fall of when Berlin fell, there's a velvet rope that separates them from the public, but they are laid on their backs. That is so interesting. Um... It's also it's also interesting to me because when we're talking about this question about monuments in the United States. And there have been these vociferous defenders. We can't remove the monuments. We're taking down history and so on. And my compromise was that I actually don't want the monuments removed. I just want them all to be toppled and displayed, <laughs> displayed on their backs. There was that wonderful Banksy um, sketch. I don't know if you saw that of what mm -hmm. should be what should replace the monument to Edward Colson in Bristol. <laughs> it was a statue of people pulling it down. Oh wow. <laughs> so, um, so look. Um, I, I think we get that debate often fundamentally wrong, you know, when it's framed in terms of is it history or is it hate? It's neither. It's about values. We yeah. don't put up historical monuments to everybody. I mean, this is just, you don't put up a monument to your Aunt Mildred unless your Aunt Mildred happened to have done something really special, you know. So we pick and choose the people that we put up monuments to because they embody values that we want our communities to have and we want our children to honor. And that's the first thing that everybody has to recognize about this debate, it seems to me, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, then you say, so I agree with you, this history should not be forgotten, but they sure as hell don't forget it in Germany. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, and there are absolutely no, I said there are absolutely no monuments to Nazis. And somebody of course pointed out in some, in a little town, there's still a monument that somebody put up in 1935 and hasn't taken down. But prominently, there's certainly none in Berlin and there are no prominent ones anywhere else. And they still, I wonder if, I've never been to Moscow, unfortunately, not yet, um, but I, I um, there's a museum in Berlin where they also, they do something similar. And I wonder if they learned that from Moscow. I'm actually supposed to do something there tomorrow. So I will ask them. 
um, you know, where they take the monuments that they don't want anymore and they put them on the floor and they let children climb on them. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that's very important that I think um, I'm always surprised at how few Americans understand this, but I, of course, had to come to Berlin. I also came to Berlin with a Fulbright in the 80s um, to, as a student, um, you know, to learn. Because of the Cold War, the Soviet Union's contribution to the war effort was uh, completely left out of American and British history. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that they see themselves as having faced an existential threat. They see themselves as having saved the world from fascism. Mm -hmm. And they are not wrong. Mm -hmm. We're talking a sacrifice of 13 million Red Army soldiers mm -hmm. and 14 million Soviet civilians gave their lives to free Europe from, uh, from fascism. And, you know, it's, it's painful to see that left out of the, the standard story that we tell ourselves about World War II um, and who won the war and, and who was responsible. And, and also, I think that it, it impacts how we have moved through the world subsequently. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, 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 in addition to the monuments being on the ground, uh, there's uh, a, a gigantic photograph. And it's a photograph of Russia, of uh, Soviets digging trenches to keep the German army out of Moscow. Uh, and when I say Soviets, I mean elderly women. Yeah. And it was like, it was one of the most affecting images I've ever seen, where it was like everyone, every single person in the society will do everything we have to do to keep the German army out of Moscow. Uh, and, you know, the world to have that happen and, you know, 27 million people die uh, and the world kind of be unaware of it is a particular, particularly kind of curious uh, amnesia as well. And that even if it's kind of at the risk of a tangent, that became very apparent to me in a very awkward exchange I had when I was in Moscow, where uh, someone I was talking with uh, a group of students and one who was a, a cinephile, absolutely a loved American cinema. And the question of whether I had seen uh, Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards came up. Uh -huh. And I said, yes, I saw it. And uh, they said, what did you think? I said, oh, it was very interesting. It was a good movie. It was, a, you know, and I could tell immediately that I had said something wrong. Uh huh. And they said, yes, but that is, you know, in the, in the film, if you haven't seen it, it's about- Oh, I have seen it. I was just saying for the, for the audience, if they haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, it's a plot in which, uh, a kind of crack team of Jewish commandos uh, from the United States kill Hitler, orchestrate Hitler's death. Uh, and uh, I said, it was you know, really interesting. And they said, but this is not how Hitler died. And I said, yeah, it's just kind of a fantasy. You know, it's not really trying to be historical. And the student said to me, well, how can Americans deal with a fantasy of how Hitler died if they've never acknowledged the history of how Hitler died. It's a very good point. Um, a few remarks about Tarantino. So a friend of mine who I interviewed in the book, he was the creator of the, the Wehrmacht exhibit and his father was a major Nazi finance person. I mean, he was a real war profiteer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so can you imagine inheriting money that you know is as dirty as the money could possibly be? And, you know, if you're a good man, which this friend of mine is, you spend a lot of your life figuring out what good you can do with it. Um, you know, and one of the things that he did was the, was the Wehrmacht exhibit, but he's done a lot of other things. But he told me, he said he clapped like a child when he saw that because he just, he loved the fantasy of everybody exploding in the theater. The other really interesting thing about Tarantino, and that was a beginning of, uh, it was actually, yeah, even before 2015 that I was thinking about this. Um, 
I then saw Django Unchained. I was not a huge Tarantino fan, but I saw Django Unchained with one of my daughters in a Berlin theater. And we started looking at each other and saying, the Americans are never going to get this film. Mm -hmm. Because there were so many references to German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung and um, later, um, and none of the reviews talked about it. I got very interested in the film. None of the reviews talked about it, but there was a long interview that Henry Louis Gates did with Tarantino mm -hmm. and he t uh, in which he said, yes, he had spent time when he was working on Inglorious Bastards with uh, Christoph Waltz, mm -hmm. the leading mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who had explained to him, uh, you know, how the Germans dealt with uh, their past, and that had inspired him to make Django Unchained. Now, which is also a fantasy. Which is I, also a fantasy, but it's funny because I found myself in the position of those Russian students because I loathed Django Unchained. I wrote a review of it for The New Yorker that was so incendiary that uh, Quentin Tarantino obliquely referenced it. <laughs> oh, I missed that somehow. I'll have to go back and look it up. Okay. It's, a, it's a kind of a thing, but we can, we can kind of move past it. Can we talk a little bit about um, the context of post-war Germany and, and kind of how global affairs impacted the way that uh, the Germans uh, you know, worked off the past? And I'm also interested in the generation uh, that uh, came of age after like the Red Army faction uh, era uh, of Germans who completely thought that they, they, their parents' generation had nothing they could say to them whatsoever. You know, most people of that generation thought their parents could say nothing to them at all. That is not only the people who joined the Red Army, but also the people who refused to read Goethe or mm -hmm. the people who maybe came home for half a day at Christmas. I mean, families were really, really, um, I mean, alienated is, is too strong, too, too mild a word, destroyed might be better. Um, because when that generation grew up and realized what their parents had done, which had been, you know, just as silent. I mean, we were talking before about how the South didn't want to talk about the war, the, the North didn't want to talk about the war. Um, that was just as true in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let me try and frame this by asking people to remember that uh, there were two Germanys. Uh, one was communist and one was capitalist. And there's something that people forget. I mean, I've seen on American posters, this um, statement of the German pastor, Martin Niemöller. First they came for the communists, but I wasn't a communist. And then they came for the socialists. I'm sure you've seen it. It used to yeah, hang, yeah. hang in people's college dorms. And it's, the it's idea- a staple of the internet. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, the, the sentiment is right. That is, if anybody's civil rights uh, are violated, eventually everybody's civil rights will be violated. But what people forget is that he was just speaking historically, first they did come for the communists and then they did come for the socialists. And what that meant is that when the war was over, the people who ran East Germany uh, had spent the war either in exile or in concentration camps. So they really were anti-fascists with their whole being. There was no, you know, ambivalence about it whatsoever. They had, you know, seen their loved ones die and narrowly escaped death themselves. So they were really committed to rooting out fascism. Now, that does, that's not true of the population at large, really. I mean, it was the same population, basically. But in the East, they instituted, you know, so they, they, did more trials of former Nazis. They put more former Nazis out of uh, jobs. You have to remember how much of Germany is government jobs. I mean, from every university and every school to uh, you know all of the ordinary, whether it's police or courts or whatever. There's a, and culture, um, importantly, um, you know, Europe subsidizes public culture. So so you have all of these public servants in the West 
almost all of them had been Nazis and in the East really quite few. Um, and there was much more public programming. They turned the Buchenwald concentration camp into a monument and school children had to visit it and all of that. Now it was instrumentalized, of course, you know, it was part of the, uh, you know, it was often used for propaganda, but I have argued and I've talked to enough people about this that it was quite genuine. Mm -hmm. So that's going on in at least on the part of most people, it was quite genuine. And I've talked to a lot of people who were dissidents uh, in East Germany and who actually, you know, put their lives on the line, but said, uh, you know, I could criticize everything else about East Germany, but not the anti-fascism. So that's going on on one side. On the other side, um, you, the U.S. starts a denazification program, mm -hmm. which is meant to re-educate people. Mm -hmm. But in 1947, they decide that um, fighting communists is more important than rooting out old Nazis. Right. So they basically stop denazification, which the Germans hadn't liked anyway. Conrad Adenauer gives some reparations to Holocaust survivals in the state of Israel. And the unstated but very clear bargain is leave us alone, let it, we'll, get, we'll pay some money. And in exchange, we won't really have to do any sort of deep examination of uh, our present society or what led to it. But that starts chipping away, um, starting in the late 50s, early 60s, you have some church groups who are active and insist on remembering Nazi crimes. Then as you say, the 60s in, in uh, Germany also talked about the war in Vietnam, but what was really explosive for people were the crimes that their own parents and teachers had committed. So um, those were very much in the forefront. You have this little moment in which Willy Brandt comes to power mm -hmm. and rather mistakenly, I think um, the most iconic post-war German photo is Willy Brandt kneeling in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. Mm -hmm. And that photo went around the world. And I think most people thought that that was a typical reaction because um, that's how we expected the Germans to feel. We thought they should fall down on their knees, you know, and atone for the crimes they had committed. Um, Brandt himself, as a social democrat, had gone into exile as soon as the um, Nazis came to power and um, had nothing to atone for personally, but he felt he had to do that as, as chancellor of the country. But uh, more than half of his country folk thought he was wrong to do it. So that was not something, you know, that was not a popular gesture within Germany. It was very popular abroad. But you have this grassroots push, um, nevertheless, going on, yes, occasionally taking violent and terrorist forms, but but mostly people protesting, people insisting that the country remember its history until finally you get some statements from, I mean, 1985 uh, was the moment when a West German president finally said, this is the, they celebrated May 8th, by the way, in Germany because, and May 9th in Moscow because, right. It was signed, it was two hours later in Moscow when the treaty was finally signed. So, but that May 8th was a day of liberation and not a day of defeat, which is how it had been seen in West Germany for 40 years, which is pretty incredible. You know, and, and the, just, I'll just, I'll stop in a yeah. second. I just, what I, the, 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 the reason for talking about how hard this all was is, in a funny way, it's to give Americans some hope because we should not expect that this confrontation with our own histories is going to be easy. And it's clearly not. There's clearly enormous backlash, but it's nevertheless possible. I think what's really interesting about that is you raise this idea of people looking at May 8th as a day of liberation and saying, you know, what would it be like for white Southerners to celebrate 
uh, Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Right. And, and so the, the parallel that I thought about with this was Juneteenth in the United States, which is a holiday, but is recognized only by Black people. It recognizes the end of slavery uh, in Texas, which came two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And Texan, Texan slaveholders had gone to great lengths to try to obscure the fact that emancipation even occurred. Even some people going so far as moving their slaves around the state to prevent them from ever getting word of emancipation. Uh, and so this was celebrated primarily by black Texans. Uh, and then in the 1990s or so, it began being celebrated by African-Americans across the country. And then within just the last two or three years, there's been a burgeoning white recognition of you know, what Juneteenth is. I, I know because I wrote about this, there were lots I of like- I remember your New Yorker yeah, piece. Who were like, wait what, is, wait, what is this holiday? And so there's been this sense, one of the things I, I raised was the, the weird irony that the end of slavery is celebrated by the descendants of slaves. Because if there's a real moral reckoning, it's a national holiday to say we are so thankful that through whatever circumstance, we moved beyond this abysmal situation. And so I think that, um, and just as a quick kind of comment, which is going to be, I know that Ari wants to jump in with questions. Uh, this comment is going to send probably an explosion of responses on the chat um, that we won't be able to get to, but there have been a number of references to uh, the Soviets uh, ending uh, Nazism or fascism uh, and you know, saying they did this while presiding over this totalitarian, uh, abusive uh, uh, communist state and the gulag and so on. I think that is true. <laughs> I think that obviously uh, the Soviets had their own uh, motives for fighting uh, against uh, not the Nazis, especially ha after having signed a peace treaty with them, the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, peace treaty, and the the west having done the same thing with chamberlain uh three years earlier two years earlier but if we're going to have a fair and equal accounting of this we have to understand this as not simply the nazi totalitarianism that was defeated by soviet totalitarianism but also an inclusion of a totalitarian colonial system by those western european states that was e equally interwoven so we had three titanically inhumane systems that were at war for world domination in the 20th century. We have to have that entire conversation. Well, you're right. It's a really longer conversation, but I can't resist saying a couple of things. First of all, I, I know that saying anything good about East Germany provokes people. It's, it's quite funny and quite interesting, the reactions to this book in several countries now. Um, saying that America needs to look at its racist, violent past is, is almost banal uh, at this point in time to say that. Um, saying that all of us need to look at how much anti-communist propaganda has shaped our worldview drives people up a wall. Um, and um, I am arguing that we do both for people who object to what I say. I wrote 70 pages in this book. I had them fact-checked by three historians because I knew that people were going to find that chapter particularly provocative. Um, I reject the equivalence between uh, Nazism and communism. I agree with you. We do need to look at the colonial system. But I think equating them is um, missing an enormous amount of, of what's going on. And I'll throw this in. People will get angry at me about it. But there's a lot of research done about um, how hard Stalin tried to form a protective alliance with the West mm -hmm. in the years leading up to the treaty that everybody hates him for. Mm -hmm. um, that he took advantage of that treaty and took pieces of Poland, we also know. But that I, I just actually saw an incredible documentary film about this by a not a partisan or ideological 
uh, filmmaker. It's in French and German, unfortunately, so um, I, I can't tell you to get it. Um, but uh, he, none of the other allies were willing to form an alliance with him against fascism. So that's, you know, I'm not a Stalinist. I'm not even a communist. I'm a socialist, but I'm not a communist. But um, we need to face that history and get it right. And I do want to say just one more remark to your Juneteenth idea. I entirely agree with you. And I also, you know, I'm just deeply in favor of Americans realizing that black history is American history. It's not just mm -hmm. black history. I, you know, um, and, you know, this is as much a part of our history as anything else is. And, you know, that's, it opens all kinds of complicated doors, but I see Ari is trying to um, get in with some questions. Sorry to interrupt such a rich conversation, but I'm just going to throw at you a couple um, good points that were brought up by audience members and, uh, and see how you respond. We'll, we'll run a little bit late by 10 or 15 minutes if that uh, works for everyone watching. So there was a great uh, comment here by Terry just a few minutes ago about reparations. To what extent are the conversations about reparations in Germany and in the US similar and different and where do you both come out on that? Do you want to start, Jelani? Yeah, because uh, you, uh, your writing on this in the book is very provocative, so you should go first. So look, I think the first thing that has to be recognized when people say, my parents didn't, you know, my ancestors didn't own any slaves, so what does this have to do with me? Most white people uh, didn't own any slaves because when most white people in this country came in the waves of in immigration after the, the end of the Civil War. Uh, and I think that white people's reluctance to acknowledge some debt has to do with the fact that we have this hundred year old hole in our history, basically from the end of the civil war to the passage of the civil rights act. It's almost a hundred years that until very, very recently, um, certainly most white people didn't know about it. I include myself and Hillary Clinton who managed to confuse reconstruction and Jim Crow in a <laughs> campaign appearance. If you remember that, it was just, um, but, 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 um, you know, Eric Foner knew the difference, but I mean, unless you were- My upstairs neighbor, by the way. Ah, tell him the <laughs> me, actually. <laughs> I, we, we met briefly. I, um, mm -hmm. I learned from his work, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, unless you specialized in that period of American history, I have known um, professors of American history who, you know, for whom that period was a blank. But if you see the ways, it, first of all, in which the entire economic system was implicated in slavery, not only the plantations of the South, but many of the growing economic institutions of the North. And if you also see that white supremacy uh, continued as a matter of law and not simply of individual prejudice, up through the times, you know, again, you can say that at least it formally ended with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. But what that means is if your grandparents, you know, if your grandfather got a mortgage on the GI Bill uh, or your great grandparents got social security, which was closed to um, most African-Americans in the deal that FDR had to, had to run. Um, you know, then you had a financial leg up that most African-Americans didn't have. And I think knowing that history, um, you know, is really important for understanding what the debt is. And then the question is, what form the, you know, the payment of the debt should take. And you know, I'm not an economist. I know there are economists. I met Sandy Darity at a podium, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about his suggestion. I think that, you know, there, so there are economics questions that I'm not gonna touch. I, I'm a philosopher. I can think about justice, okay, um, in principle rather than either 
tactics or economics. Um, although I will say to all of the people who say, but it would cost too much, we can't possibly do that. You know, <clears throat> we don't think about the weapons budget. I mean, we just, we, that's always off the table. Um, and I learned from Malala Yousafzai that we could um, educate every child on the earth for 12 years on the profits that the arms industry makes in eight days. Jeez. And once we, once we I, I keep repeating that fact because uh, it's so striking and no one knows what to do with it. Um, you know, I, if there were a referendum, surely most people would say, oh, hey, they can, you know, eight days they can, they can spare. Um, so anyway, um, you know, there's more money out there than we acknowledge once we put uh, arm spending on the table. That's the first point. Um, and then there's the question about whether, you know, whether it should, the reparation should be, once you've established that there's something that's fundamentally owed, the question is whether reparations should be, um, you know, in forms of, of services or whether they should be in the form of a check. And I have to say, I mean, in many ways drawn to the view that Adolf Reed uh, has argued for, because I live in a social democratic society. And what that means is that I now view things like, and it took, it took quite a long time before I stopped, I started seeing medical care, education, housing, you know, sick leave, parental leave, paid vacation. Those are considered benefits in the United States. And in Europe, they're considered rights. And it's not just Scandinavia, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's all over Europe. Um, I mean, you tell people in Europe that one of the problems with the pandemic in the States is that uh, most Americans don't have sick leave or if they do, it's, you know, it's only for a small and fixed numbers of days. And they look at you as if you were mad. You know, they really see that as a fundamental human right. So I support a society in which all of those things are considered fundamental human rights for everyone. And then my next question was, well, supposing you have a Holocaust survivor in Europe, and there, there are some, who was just getting the same amount of social rights that everybody else was, wouldn't we think she was owed something else? And the answer is yes, yes. And so it's then a question of strategy, which, you know, which way you go at it. Um, but I think there is a debt, and you know what we need to do is figure out how to pay it. So this is a very quick um, reference. Um, I'm actually typing in the chat now. Um, but someone just mentioned the Homestead Act, and for people who right for people who are not familiar with American history, uh, this was literally a land giveaway, <laughs> quite literally a land giveaway, um, and so. It was passed uh, you know, during the Reconstruction era uh, by Republicans uh, who, and it was uh, giving away parcels of land in the West to families that were willing to settle uh, and farm them. Uh, and so it's not uh, simply, you know, people talk about it very much in kind of the middle of the country, uh, but there were homestead acts in the, the Pacific Northwest and this kind of land that was distributed uh, nationally with in many instances, Black people being excluded from these land grants. Well, of course, we also first have to think whose land was being given away in the West. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Other, and so this other. is also this is also a kind yeah. of uh, extension of the genocide. There's a kind of uh, uh, ethnic cleansing that had to happen in order for this land to be available. Um, right. But but the reason I make this point is that sixty or so years earlier. James Madison proposed that with the land purchased from France uh, in, in the Louisiana Purchase, that this land be sold in discrete parcels to finance 
the abolition of slavery. And so it was meant to be compensation for slaveholders. They would purchase the freedom of the enslaved population. Now, this is not reparations for the actual people who did the labor oh. <laughs> enslaved. And finally, you know, on the kind of question of morality uh, or precedent, uh, the United States, I always think it's important to recognize is the United States did pay reparations uh, at the conclusion of slavery. Uh, people don't know this, but in 1862, uh, for in Washington, Washington D.C., the nation's capital, uh, abolished slavery uh, about a year ahead of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, and they offered reparations uh, and in the course of that abolition. Uh, there's one very important asterisk here, which is that they offered these reparations to the slaveholders. <laughs> the people who were enslaved got nothing. Uh, and so there is this principle here, which is established uh, in American law and American history, but it just has not been something that people were very motivated to, to adhere to. Well, it's not just American law. Do you know that, um, that the British taxpayers just finished paying off the reparations to Jamaican slaveholders in 2015. Wow, I did not know. And, and of course, the Jamaicans didn't get anything. Right. Um, but the slaveholders, I believe Cameron's, David Cameron's related to one of the people who, who got reparations. I mean, it's incredible. But one should also point out that, you know, there were the 40 acres and a mule which would have been the least that could be offered, but a reasonable, you know, you have been farming the land for all these years. Here's your piece, it's big enough to feed your family, uh, go to it. Um, that uh, quite a bit of land was originally distributed on mm -hmm. uh, orders of the Union Army. Mm -hmm. And of course it was turned around by Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, and, you know, began uh, with uh, uh, General Sherman uh, and William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, who did it as a matter of pragmatism. He wasn't really thinking about kind of the moral issues, but uh, if we could get into like the particulars of that, you know, the, the Civil War, which is all fascinating, but I think we have like running out of time. So if okay. we can, in the interest of getting to the next question. Well, I want to jump on that with some sort of a self-serving question, but a lot of our audience members today tune into Museum of Jewish Heritage programs all the time. We get about 200,000 visitors a year in person during a normal year and hopefully many more during these virtual times. And the Holocaust Museum in Washington has over a million visitors a year. What is our responsibility as any, if any, as Holocaust museums and American Jewish institutions in the way that we make these connections for people? And, and if not us, then who should be making these connections? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, look, there are two pretty diametrically opposed orientations in Jewish tradition, and both of them are in the Bible, and both of them are in the book that probably most Jews read more often than the Bible, mainly, namely the Haggadah, which is quite interesting. And the one tradition is you were slaves in the land of Egypt, you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and therefore it's incumbent on you to welcome the, sta the stranger and stand with the slave. It's the prophetic tradition. And I have to say, I'm proud it's the one that I was raised on, okay? But as I'm sure you know, Ari, there is another tradition which says, beware Amalek, they always tried to kill us. They're always going to do it again. And, you know, indeed we need to, uh, <laughs> mixing metaphors here a little bit, drop the wagons and, you know, pull in and only protect our own tribe. And at the moment, unfortunately, I feel like, uh, you know, it's the second tradition within Judaism that is ascendant, certainly ascendant uh, in the current government of Israel. And it's not possible to say that one is truer than the other, okay? They're both there. There's textual, uh, plenty of textual and historical evidence for both of them. But I feel it's ethically incumbent on us to you know, stand with the first tradition 
And I've actually been quite moved because you're not the only Holocaust museum that has, you know, uh, shown interest in my book, um, asked me to speak, or done its own programming uh, in the wake of Black Lives Matter. And I think that's extremely important. I mean, that's only one other group that's, uh, you know, not our tribe. But I think it's extremely important because it shows that there are still enough Jews who feel like, um, you know, this is, this is the solidarity that they need to show. I mean, you know, the whole injunction to remember the Holocaust, it, it can't be the case that we're simply asking people to remember this historical event. Yes, Germans killed Jews in Germany and you know, over a six year period in the 20th century. That cannot be the reason we're told to never forget. Um, it must be the case that if we remember the Holocaust, yes, of course, it's out of respect for the particular victims. But my guess is that most, well, okay, I can't speak for a bit, but, it is at least as important to remember in order to stop any form of fascism, you know, before it gets to the point where we have to mourn another victim. Hmm. You know, what, what I find interesting um, is, so I grew up in New York City, you know, which is, you know, a polyglot city, um, obviously. Uh, I grew up in, in New York City public schools, so that meant that probably maybe half of my teachers were Jewish. And the thing I think that stood out when I got old enough to kind of think about these things was that American Jews were in a position that was uh, kind of interesting in that they were white people who understood what it meant to be hated simply for who you are. And so there was a translation that or, or a language and certain precepts that people who have been in that position understand. Not That's always, right. right. It's not a 100% guarantee. You know, there are black people who are homophobic. You know, there are, uh, you know, uh, lesbians and gays who are racist, who got, I mean, it, it kind of, it doesn't immunize people entirely, right. but it does offer you a kind of introduction to the language of what some of the precepts are here. Like, or what some of the dynamics are. Uh, I see so, something here coming up on the screen saying we were able to pass. Right, is, and so <laughs> were some Black people. And some Black people were. Yeah. Like, people who were light-skinned. It wasn't kind of unique to say that, like, uh, that only Jews would say, if I don't have to tell people that I'm in this category that of people who are hated, despised for who they are, I won't, you know, because there were some Black people who did the same or who cloaked the idea that they had Black ancestry. And so I think that, a couple of things have been noticeable to me or notable to me, which was when um, at the Jewish Cultural Center, I think it was in Kansas uh, a few years ago, where a person uh, was you know, motivated by anti-Semitism and he came out and shot, it was a mass shooting. Oh. He shot um, two people who were Protestants, right. you know, who just happened to be there. Right. Uh, and in the shooting at the uh, um, Holocaust Museum uh, in uh, Washington DC some years ago, they killed the African-American security guard. And we could go through, uh, you know, the person who was trying to kill Muslims and he, uh, in, I think this was Kansas as well, he killed, uh, uh, I believe they were Iranian or South Asian. I forget what their background, no, but South Asian. Uh, or the person who wanted to kill Muslims in Wisconsin and he killed Sikhs. Uh, and so I think there's a kind of common understanding of peril that these forces, for people who understand this history, the history from their own particular individual vantage point, it is not just a kind of uh, easy cliche when Dr. King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. It is quite literal. <laughs> things translate into jeopardy for all sorts of different people. Uh, and so I think that that is, to the extent that I can understand like institutions, I think that all of the institutions that have this um, calling, you know, I'd say that the African American Museum in Washington, DC, uh, you know, the museums, uh, you know, 
globally, the Museum of the Gulag uh, in Moscow, like all these institutions that kind of understand what levels of human suffering we have seen in this world had that common obligation of vigilance, I'd say. See, I'm really glad to hear you say that. And my guess is that a Jew who decides to become a public school teacher in New York City is going to be someone who has this universalist tradition in mm -hmm. him, her. Um, you know, somebody who, uh, oh, Jesus, I don't care if I mention names or not. This is, I'm not the, speaking for the museum. Someone like Stephen Miller, mm -hmm. right? Um, who, as we know, um, is, uh, you know, is a Jew who's, you know, trying to keep out other people. I mean, there, I, I don't want, I don't, I have no idea how many people Stephen Miller represents, mm -hmm. but I do know that the, I, I wouldn't even, sometimes people talk about Black Jewish Alliance. I wouldn't call it an alliance. An alliance, I, I'm not crazy about the word ally. Um, mm -hmm. An ally is somebody who stands with you temporarily because their interests align with yours, like the United States and the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. but not somebody who, you know, and then if their principles diverge, then they go in different directions. Um, I think the, um, the unity really between blacks and Jews, many Jews uh, during the civil rights movement in the sixties came exactly out of the, the kind of experience that you're talking about and the kind of commitment uh, that you're talking about. And I have to say with shame that, you know, I, that was what, when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I was told that's what it is to be Jewish. And our synagogue was bombed. It was a, the Atlanta synagogue that was bombed because the rabbi was engaged in the, in the civil rights movement. Most of the people in the synagogue were not, but my mother was. Mm. Um, but, you know, and then I had to grow up and realize, well, there's this other Jewish tradition too, which basically says, you know, instead of being universalist, it's tribalist. And, you know, I'm glad that you got enough experience of the universalist tradition, because that's the one that I want to uphold. And I will add one last, I know, Ari, I just said one last, last little point. I, I no, I'm covered, ask, um, in oh. I'll give you each an opportunity to, to close. In offering your final thoughts, um, there's so many questions we haven't gotten to. For people who are interested in this topic, in, in working off the past and learning from, from the Germans so that we can work off the past, do you have one more book suggestion for further reading? So from both of you, a book suggestion and any other closing thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say my friend Ibram, Ibram Kendi's book, um, Stamped from the Beginning, uh, which is a very good history. I have a book that I'm writing uh, on a kind of related subject that kind of builds from the, uh, the church massacre in Charleston into the bigger discussion wow. of white nationalism and terror in the United States. But that's not done yet, but support it when it comes out. And I will say there's one, there's one other thing um, to Susan's point is that uh, I covered the Tree of Life massacre uh, in Pittsburgh. And it struck, having lived in Atlanta, the first reference that I got was the bombing of the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation in Atlanta, because it was for the same reason. It, it was, was a combination of the, the uh, inherent anti-Semitism mixed with the belief that the Jews were behaving um, in, in too kindred a fashion or too humane a fashion to people who were uh, meant to never be part of America. Uh, and so that was what motivated the bombing in 1958 in Atlanta. Uh, and it was the, in the writings of the person who committed the murder of 11 people um, in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, believing that he was striking out at a community that had been uh, assisting refugees in coming to the United States. And the same sort of like, cocktail of those two beliefs. And so it just kind of goes to my belief, again, to close out that where any are threatened, all are threatened. Um, that sounds great. And I'm looking forward to your book. Um, 
it's a little tacky to recommend one's own book, but um, I did just write a book about this subject. And I can I recommend it for you. I can recommend Susan's book, so you're not recommending it yourself. Thank you. I, I mean, if I knew of another book that did exactly that, I would recommend it too, but I don't. I mean, books that I really learned a lot about American history from, particularly this period that I feel most white people, um, you know, are, are vague on. Um, so there's, there are three. One is Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's also an incredible writer as well as an incredible human being. The second one is by Douglas Blackman, Slavery mm -hmm. by Another mm -hmm. Name, um, which is a shocking and really important book. And the third would be the book by Edward Baptist, uh, The Half Has Never Been Told, which talks about the centrality of cotton to the entire American economy. And I, you know, I, I feel like if you read those three books, and they're all well written. They're not, none of them are, you know, sort of big, thick, uh, you know, academic books. They're all well written. I think one won a Pulitzer and another one. Anyway, they're. Um, but uh, if you read those three books, you'll you'll come a long way to um, you know filling up the gap in our historical knowledge. Or you can just have them summarized and read my book. <laughs> Thank you both for your time. And you can see, Ari, uh, we could have kept going. We could have talked about this for the rest of the afternoon. So, well, I hope we'll get to do this in person sometime. I uh, when Likewise. people travel again, I come to New York. You know, I, we could talk about it forever. And I'll say, in in one sense, that's what we do as New York Holocaust Museum. It's our responsibility to talk about this uh, forever. Uh, and when we say we're a living memorial, that's the living part of it. So if it's not tacky to suggest books, I'm also gonna suggest other programs briefly while we're here. For those of you who are watching, if you found today interesting, tune in this Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, we have a book talk for Talia Lavin's Culture Warlords, My Journey into the Dark Web of White Supremacy um, with Tarso Luis Ramos as well. Um, and we have a book talk for Ruth ben Giat's upcoming book, Strongman Mussolini to the Present. Uh, with Jason mm. Stanley later this month. Um, we also did a, a, a fascinating program recently on translating Black Lives Matter into Yiddish. So we'll throw all this into oh, a cool. hacked follow-up email afterwards, along with a recording of today's program, which will go up on YouTube. Uh, but thank you both for being here. Please buy Susan's book, donate to the museum to enable us to put on programs like these, buy Jelani's book when it comes out. Um, and we're just grateful to be able to have conversations like this. Thanks, I really enjoyed meeting you, Jelani. Thank you so much for the invitation. This uh, conversation has been the high point of my day. No, oh, cool. You. Mine too. All right. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>